Good morning. Good morning. The universe is about 14 billion years old and it contains billions of stars and around many of the stars there are planets. On the vast majority of these planets, maybe even all of them except one, nothing very much goes on. There's nothing but rock and dust. If anything moves, it's just a bit of wind or a bit of volcanic action. But on one planet, and possibly only one planet, in the entire universe, something very, very strange happened. And it started to happen about four billion years ago. And at the end of the process that began then, we have the stirring of movement, of life, complexity. You, of course you know which planet I'm talking about, it's this one. And it may be the only planet in the universe that this has happened to. And now look around you and you see animals hopping about, you see birds flying, you see fish and dolphins swimming, you see plants growing. Nothing like the rock and sand and deadness that you find on possibly all the other planets. What was it that happened? What's different about this planet? Nobody knew until the middle of the 19th century when Charles Darwin finally worked it out. And now ever since then, um, Darwin wrote his book The Origin of Species 150 uh, years ago. And ever since then, we've gradually been filling in the, the details. And now it's absolutely certain that Darwin was right. And we now essentially understand why we're all here, what life is all about, uh, what is the meaning of it all. It's, it started with, with Darwin, but we've been building on it ever since. Now, I know that a number of people have difficulties with understanding Darwin's theory of evolution and with accepting it, with believing it, uh, and I'm here to answer your questions about it if you have some. But I'd like to begin by asking whether any of you have some thoughts of your own, some opinions that you'd like to, to give me. We might even make a list on the, on the board of ideas that people have, and that'll give us a sort of framework to talk about when we, when we get started. Uh, y yes? Okay. Do you find it a bit coincidental that this planet was in the exact right position, had the exact ingredients to make life. Okay, that's a very nice point. Shall I write that down or, or, or can we all, all remember that? I think we can remember that. Um, what were you going to say? Um, can you still believe in God and, and e evolution? Okay, thank you very much. Um, shall we have one more point and then we might start talking about those? Or shall we just start now? Yes. Um, how does the evolution add to like the meaning of life, what does it tell us that meaning of life actually is? Okay. Now, the, the first question was, isn't it a bit of a coincidence that everything on this planet is exactly right? Uh, yes, um, it is. Uh, let's um, approach this from a slightly different angle. If it wasn't exactly right for our kind of life, then maybe it's a different kind of life that would have evolved here. Remember that life adapts through natural selection to fit the conditions in which it finds itself. And so, to some extent, you can say that if, you, if there's a planet in the universe that's capable of, it, of housing any kind of life at all, then it's the kind of life that will evolve on that planet that can evolve on that planet. So if, for example, there's a planet that is very much hotter than ours, then the kind of life you'd expect to evolve would be life that's suited to a much, much hotter climate. So it's no accident that our kind of life is very well suited to live on this planet because this is the planet that it's evolved on. Having said that, life itself has changed this planet a great deal. For example, this planet is now filled with oxygen and we all have to breathe oxygen. But there wasn't any oxygen when Earth started. All the oxygen that's free in the atmosphere has come into the atmosphere because of plants and photosynthetic bacteria. So life has actually changed the planet and life has also accommodated itself, has also adapted to fit the changed conditions. Originally when life evolved it was anaerobic. Have you heard that word? Uh, it lived in, under non-oxygen conditions and later when the plants filled the atmosphere with oxygen life 
gradually evolved so that it no longer treated oxygen as a poison, which it would have been originally, but actually started to adapt itself to live in oxygen until now we absolutely need oxygen. We can't do without oxygen. Uh, now, the second question was... Um, about um, God and whether we can believe in both. Evolution. Can you believe in both God and evolution? Lots and lots of scientists do. Uh, and moreover, lots and lots of senior religious leaders believe in evolution. So if you, if you were to talk to the Pope or the Archbishop of Canterbury or just about any bishop you can think of, you'll find that they all believe in evolution. They all, of course, also believe in God. And they will have various things that they'll say. They might say that maybe God started the universe off and then evolution took over later or something of that sort. There are some people who think that, uh, they, of course they believe that evolution is true, because it obviously is, but they may say that God helps evolution along sometimes. Maybe there are some little difficult steps in evolution that God uh, assists evolution. I don't believe that, but there are some uh, churchmen who do believe that. And there are some very uh, respectable scientists who are religious. When I say respectable scientists, they of course believe in evolution because all respectable scientists do believe in evolution. But they also believe in God. And the third question was... And how does evolution um, you know, put into the meaning of life? What is the meaning of life if you're... What's the meaning of life in, on, on, a, on an evolutionary worldview? One thing to say is that the universe doesn't owe us any meaning. It could be that there is no meaning of life. And if so, that would be just tough. Uh, I don't think that because I think that we can all make the, whatever meaning we choose to make uh, and you, each of you, will have plenty of meanings in your own life. Uh, you'll be enthusiastic about some things, uh, maybe some sport you play, maybe some books you read, maybe your love life, maybe your, your family life, uh, maybe some of you love nature, some of you love music. Uh, these are all individual meanings that you can give to your life. That doesn't mean that life itself has one special meaning. It doesn't mean that we are here for any particular purpose, any more than mountains are here for a purpose or rocks are here for a purpose. Rocks are just here. Rocks just happen. They are here. Mountains just happen. They are here. There is a sense in which life is just here. Life came about through the evolutionary process. But after billions of years of evolution, Life forms arose that had big brains, big nervous systems, and we've got the biggest brains of all for our size. And so our brains are capable of developing purposes of our own. We, with our big brains, can think of our own purposes. We can aim at things in life. We can have a grand design for the whole of our life, which is the privilege that we enjoy because our brains are so big. And the reason our brains are so big is that evolution uh, gave us big brains. Over a very, very long period of time, the brains of our ancestors got gradually bigger and bigger and bigger until they eventually became so big that they're now capable of enjoying music and poetry and mathematics and love and all the things that give our lives meaning and give our lives our own individual purpose. Okay, those, those are three points we've had. Now, does anybody else want to... Has anybody got an opinion they'd like to offer of their own? Perhaps something, that, some difficulty that you have? Has evolution finished, or are we still going to change in the future? Evolution goes much more slowly than we can imagine, because we live on a time scale of years and, de and decades. And so, uh, if you think about change during your own lifetime, no, you're not going to see that. Um, if you look back in time, you, if you went back, say, two million years, you'd find that our ancestors had smaller brains than we did. If you went back three million years, smaller brains still. If you went back six million years, you'd find that our ancestors were the common ancestors of chimpanzees and presumably walked around on all fours. So when you think about what's happened in the last six million years, it's we've, we've risen on our hind legs and uh, our brains have swollen up like a balloon. But remember that that swelling up like a balloon took took two, two or three million years. So you might say, in, if you come back in a time machine in three million years' time, would you expect to find that the brain was sort of huge, uh, like, like a horrible monster in science fiction? 
In order for that to happen, it would be necessary that natural selection goes on favouring big brains. And that means that the biggest brains individuals among us are the ones who are most likely to survive and most likely to reproduce. Now, in the past, that must have been true, because otherwise we wouldn't have the big brains that we have. Over the past two or three million years, it must have been true that the, the individuals with the biggest brains were the ones who survived best, or at least who reproduced the most, had the, had the most offspring. Is there any reason to suppose nowadays that the biggest brains individual, biggest brained individuals are the ones who survive best? Not that I can see. Or is there any reason to suppose that the ones with the biggest brains are the ones who have the most children? Again, not that I can see. So it, it certainly isn't clear that the evolutionary trends that we've seen for the past two million years are going to continue for the next two million years. Far from it. If you wanted to predict what was going to happen in the next two million years, you'd have to say to yourself, which types of us, which individual sorts of us, are the ones who are most likely to have, to have children? Obviously, some people have lots of children, other people don't. In order for evolution to occur by natural selection, it would be necessary that individuals who have the most children are genetically different from individuals who have the least children. And that difference has got to continue for a million, two million years in order for us to see a consistent change. Well, that isn't very likely, is it? Uh, not obviously. If you ask, why are people born? Why are people here rather than, rather than not here? Maybe some of us are here because our parents were not very competent in the use of contraceptives. <laughs> so maybe um, uh, if there were a genetic tendency to be incompetent in the use of contraceptives, then that would be a natural selection pressure. If, if people who are bad at using contraceptives um, have, have, a, have certain genes and people who are good at using contraceptives have other genes. You see, this is a kind of joking way of putting it, but this is the kind of thing we need to, to, to be looking at. Then we would have natural selection in favour of incompetence. Okay? Do you, you see that? I mean, that, that follows from natural selection. But in order for that to give rise to an evolutionary trend, it will be necessary that whatever it takes to be incompetent now will be the same as whatever it takes to be incompetent in a million years' time, or two million years' time. And since we live in a technological society, the very idea of using contraceptives as my sort of joke example, it implies that we're living in a, in a um, technological society. And who knows what the technology will be like, not just in a million years, but in, 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 in 50 years. And so it's pretty difficult to predict what's going to happen in in future evolution. If we start thinking about going into outer space, then that might be another matter, because if we start sending colonies of people to live, to live on Mars, to live in great big domes, greenhouses, like the Eden Project on Mars, then whatever it takes to survive there would, might be very different from whatever it takes to survive here. And we could imagine a new uh, race of people evolving in colonies on Mars. Do any of you have um, difficulties with uh, Darwin's theory of evolution that you'd like to, to raise with me because I might be able to help? Yes? Um, I just don't understand the way that, well, there's like this one cell that developed into this whole universe. Where did that one cell come from? That well, um, the, the one cell you're talking about would have been the first, the origin of life. It might have been, it wouldn't have really been like a bacterium because a bacterium is actually quite an advanced kind of... Um, cell. It probably would have been something rather simpler than a bacterium. I think it's fairly clear that once you've got a bacterium, uh, then quite a lot could follow from that because you, you know about, you, you, you've all learned about variation and competition and natural selection. And so from bacteria you could get sort of colonies of bacteria, you could get um, more complicated cells, from there you could get groupings of complicated cells, uh, have you learned about the origin of the eukaryotic cell? Yeah, okay, <laughs> never mind about that. Um, uh, but I think your, your question is, is going further than that, which is to the origin of life itself. And that's a rather more difficult question, because the origin of life would not have been the origin of the first bacterium. Bacteria are too complicated to just suddenly come into existence. It must have been something simpler than that. And nobody knows what it was, 
Uh, it probably happened about 4 billion years ago. The first bacterial fossils appear a bit, a bit older than 3.5 billion years ago. Um, so somewhere between 4 billion and, th and 3.5 billion years ago, uh, life originated. And by life in this case, I don't mean something as complicated as a bacterial cell. I mean something uh, would have been a chemical event. It would have been the first self-replicating entity. By replicating, that means copying. You know the thing about DNA is that it makes copies of itself. It makes almost perfect copies of itself. Not quite perfect, because you have mutation. and Without mutation, you couldn't have evolution. But almost perfect copies of itself. The origin of life, the thing that really triggered the possibility of life evolving, was a chemical event sometime in the early Earth where a chemical arose which had the remarkable property of making copies of itself. And not, and not necessarily exact copies of itself, occasionally copies of itself that were mistaken, so that there are two different or three different or five or a million different kinds, different versions of this molecule. And once you have different versions of a self-copying molecule, then you have the origin of competition, because some of them would be a little bit better at making copies of themselves than others, a little bit better at using the chemical resources that were around, which would have been um, probably in, in the sea. And then the whole process gets started. It's a slow, gradual, bootstrapping process, starting from very, very simple beginnings, and then working up to uh, greater and greater complexity. Yeah. I don't get the Big Bang. You don't get the Big Bang? Yeah, because, like, there wasn't any scientists that time, so how do they know? Um, the Big Bang is what physicists tell us started the universe off. Physicists haven't always thought that there was a Big Bang. Uh, there was a time when uh, quite a lot of physicists thought the universe had always been in existence. And the evidence mainly comes from cosmology mainly comes from looking at the very, very distant galaxies. You know that the, that the matter in the universe is divided not just into stars, but the stars are clustered into galaxies, which are huge kind of island universes separated from each other by vast distances of space. And uh, what became apparent in the early decades of the 20th century is that the galaxies are all receding, not just from us, but from each other. The entire universe is expanding, moving apart. All the galaxies are moving apart from each other. And they told this by the redshift of, as you perhaps say, I won't, I won't go into that. There, there is very good astronomical evidence that the galaxies are moving apart. And when people, when astronomers realized that, they worked out where they were moving apart from, and they worked out that the universe at one time had to be all in one place, all concentrated in one tiny area, and tiny little, little volume, which exploded at some point, and they could even date when that explosion was, by extrapolating backwards from the rate at which the uh, galaxies are expanding away from each other, up, 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 up retreating from each other. So they worked out that the universe began at a particular moment, and the, the estimate of, of when that moment was has changed from time to time it, because the measurements get better and better. And it's now thought to be somewhere around 14 billion years ago. Well, of course, you and I, who are used to asking questions like what happened before something, are immediately tempted to say, well, what happened before the Big Bang? And this is where I lose my physicist friends, because my physicist friends tell me there was no such thing as before. You're not even allowed to ask the question before. Uh, and I guess all of you are pretty baffled by that, and I am too. I don't understand why you're not allowed to, to ask that question. But what physicists will tell you is that time itself began at that instant in the Big Bang. Before the Big Bang, there was no time and there was no space. Time and space came into existence at that instant, that extraordinary moment called the Big Bang. Now, there are physicists who say 
everything you've just everything I've just told you is true, but it's only true for this universe. This universe is all we know about. The universe in which we're in is all we know about. But there are some physicists who say that there is a multiverse, which is a kind of collection of billions of universes. It's like a sort of foaming, bubbling foam. And each bubble in the foam is one universe. And we are in one of those bubbles. And our universe, our bubble, began 14 billion years ago. But nobody knows anything about these other bubbles. Uh, and uh, they can make conjectures about them, and, and those conjectures, to some extent, can be, uh, can, be, can be tested. But, so it could be that there is a sort of meaning to the question, what happened before the Big Bang? But not within our universe, not within our local bubble. But as you've guessed, uh, I certainly can't answer your question. And uh, physicists can give a better answer than I can, because I'm a biologist, not a physicist. But I suppose the main lesson I'd ask you to take from this is that there's an awful lot that science doesn't know. Science is an open-ended procedure which, which is, is, it feeds on its own lack of knowledge and works on its own lack of knowledge and tries to, to, to ask questions which at present are baffling. So never get the idea that science thinks it knows everything. It's very, very far, far from it. There's an awful lot that we don't know. And if only we could come back in 500 years' time, we'd probably find great vistas of new, of new stuff that we didn't know about. And in just the same way as if somebody came to our time from 500 years ago, they would have their minds completely blown by what modern science could tell them. Thank you very much. Now, I think you've all been writing down things you'd like to discuss, so who'd like to start by mentioning... Yeah, OK. If it's a theory, why do we have to write in a fact in our GCSEs just to get a good grade? Sorry, it, say that again. If evolution's a theory, why do we have to write as a fact in our GCSEs just to get a good grade? Well, I hope you don't do anything just to get good grades. <laughs> uh, but anyway, let, let's go on to the, to the next question. I mean, we're, we're, what we're going to do is accumulate a list of questions, and then we're going to go through them all. It's a great question. Uh, yeah. What's your take on the missing link of the theory of evolution? The missing link is the next question, OK? Is somebody writing this down, and then we can deal with them all. Who's next? Yeah. How can you prove evolution is 100% fact, and uh, God doesn't like, God doesn't exist or anything like that? OK, well, I didn't say I could, did I? But anyway, let, let's write that one down, too. Um, over there, yes. Yep. Oh, I've heard that um, humans and apes have evolved from one species. Is it possible that they can evolve back into one big species? Is it possible that humans and apes could evolve back into one big species? Okay, yes? Um, if we are taught about evolution and science, and then in RE we talk, we talk about the way God created the, uh, the world, who are, we, who are we really meant to believe? Very good question, yes. Okay. Yeah, um, the theory suggests that humans are going to evolve again, but all of our body systems and body parts all work perfectly in the moment, so why do they need to evolve again? Okay, I don't know quite what you mean by evolve again, but let's write that one down too. Yeah. What were Darwin's religious beliefs and how did they affect what he believed? Okay, thank you. Yes, there. Uh, would it be possible for humans to evolve so much they become immune to every disease? Interesting, yes. Nice one. Um, uh, yes, there. Um, what came first, like a plant or the oxygen? What came first? A uh, plant or the oxygen. Plant. <laughs> I, I didn't hear the. Plant. Plant. Sorry. So we're talking about plants and Oh, plants. Oxygen. Yes. Okay. Okay. Um, yes, you haven't had that. Um, if dinosaurs became extinct, do you think humans would become extinct as well? 99% of all species that have ever lived have gone extinct, so quite likely, yes. Um, you say that there's lots that science doesn't know, but that religion can fill in the, the cracks for, so like, why do you not believe in like, religion? Uh, okay, thank you. Um, I don't understand how different skin colours and races form from evolution and from apes. I believe that God must have played... Different skin colours? Yeah, and races from yes. apes and evolution. OK, have we got enough questions to be going on with now, do you think? Yes. 
Um, let's take, let's take the, the first thing there. Um, I think it was a young lady over there asked about if evolution is a theory, why do we have to say it's a fact in order to uh, get good grades in our, in our GCSE? And I said, I hoped you didn't do anything just to get good grades in your GCSE. Has anybody got an idea how to answer her on that? What, what does it mean to say that evolution is just a theory? What does, what does the word theory mean to, it, to anybody? Yeah. Something's not being prov proven just based on like theory, like someone's okay. knowledge. Um, so would you say that it's, it's a theory that the Earth is round and not flat? Because mm. one, once upon a time people thought the world was flat, didn't they? And there must have been a time when uh, people said, uh, well, I've got a theory that the world's round. And then other people said, well, my theory is that the world's flat. And finally, the, the round theory kind of won out. So nowadays we call it a fact. Do you think that maybe uh, th theories go through a stage of being theories and then eventually they become facts when it becomes uh, really rather silly not to believe in them anymore? Could that be a possible way to answer that question? Yeah. What does anybody think about that? Sorry? Yeah. Um, what, what about you who asked the question? I mean, what, do, what, do, do you feel just a theory means sort of just as likely to be wrong as right? Or do you think that it's possible for theories to be so well supported that uh, they might as well be called facts? Uh, they can be theory, but if it's a fact, then it's a fact. Yeah. Um, what about the, the, your friends who you're talking about? What do you think about that? Uh, yeah, I, I think that what you said about the world being theories saying that the world was flat and then round, yeah, I, I agree that there were theories to start with, but we know, we found that there's evidence that it is round because people have gone into space, but with Darwin's theory, we haven't actually found the evidence, so... Okay, so what you're saying is that there's a distinction between going into space and actually looking at the world and seeing with your own two eyes that it's round. Yeah. Whereas the evidence for evolution is a bit more indirect than that. Yeah. Okay, now when a detective uh, comes on the scene of a crime, and obviously the detective hasn't seen the murder, because if he had, he'd know. Uh, but nevertheless, the detective takes fingerprints and blood samples and looks at footprints and... Uh, builds up a, a very, very strong case. And sometimes the case can be so strong, every bit of evidence points in that direction. Can't that sometimes be as good as, or maybe even better than eyewitness evidence? Because, you know, eyewitness evidence can actually be wrong. People are mistaken. People think they recognize somebody's face when they, when they don't. And it, there's quite a lot of good, good evidence that eyewitness evidence in courts of law is actually less reliable than uh, for, for individual identification than uh, DNA evidence, for example. Because DNA evidence is the equivalent of the evidence that, that evolution is true. Perhaps you haven't got a full impression of how strong the evidence actually is. It's, it's as though you had a million, ten million different pieces of evidence, all pointing in the same direction, every single one of them pointing in, in the same direction. Nobody's actually seen evolution take place over a long period, but they've seen the after effects, and the after effects are massively supported by evidence, not just one bit of evidence, but hundreds, millions of bits of evidence, all pointing in the same direction. It's like a, a case in a court of law where nobody can actually stand up and say, I saw the murder happen. But yet, you've got millions and millions of pieces of evidence which no reasonable person could possibly dispute. That's sort of the, the way it is. And so, you, you shouldn't really take too seriously this thing about only a theory. Because in that philosophical sense, everything is only a theory. Let's go on to another one. Could talk about this one? It's a very, very good question. It's a, which I think, who is it who asked the question about religion? Um, a very good question. I think it was, was the idea that um, you know, we may be told something in science class, but we're also told something that, uh, in, mm -hmm. I in RE. Yeah. In RE. Yes. Um, and, you know, one of his questions. Okay, what, what does anybody think about that? You're, you're told one thing in science class, 
Um, firstly, is it really true that in RE you're taught? Uh, I mean, are you taught Adam and Eve? Or, or, or? Yeah. yeah. But I mean, what about um, other other creation myths? What about the Hindu creation myth, for example? It's quite different. Um, does it, do you get Adam and Eve instead? You get Rama. We get everything. We sort of get you get everything. Okay, so you get lots of different creation myths, and they're all different from each other. So how do you decide which one to believe? It's a decision. We Sorry. Make. It's a decision that we have to make. You you, We're you make your own decision. Okay. So and, and how do you how do you make the decision? I mean, does anybody else? Do do do, do some of you favour one creation myth? Does some of you favour the Rama? Creation myth, for example. Anybody favour that? What about the Adam and Eve ones? Anybody favour the Adam and Eve one? Okay. You you do. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and why why do you favour the Adam and Eve one? Because I was brought up to believe it. You're brought up to believe it. Is that yeah. a good reason to believe something? Do you think? Yeah, because I went to church since I was little. So. Yeah. And it says it in the Bible. Yes, but um, in the in the Hindu sacred scriptures, it says something different, doesn't it? Yeah, but they're brought up to believe that one. Then yes. Be so you mean everybody should just believe what they're brought up to believe, even though it, they contradict each other? Yeah, but people change when they get older. Like some people will convert from being Hindu to Christianity, or from so Christianity to being Hindu. Yeah. Yes. And you're you're happy about that, are you? Yeah. Okay, it's a very satisfied position to be in. Um, yeah. Keep that one again, but sort of related to evolution. And the science. Yes. The science. Uh, if you were to ask me why I believe what I believe, which is evolution, the very last thing I would say is because I was brought up to believe it. Absolutely the last thing I would say. I would say the reason I believe it is because here is the evidence. And I would say here's a book of evidence, and here's another book of evidence, and here's another book of evidence. And you can go and look at fossils, you can go and look at DNA evidence. You can look at the evidence of the geographical distribution of animals and plants. That's evidence. Saying that it says so in my holy book, what kind of evidence is that? Does anybody seriously think that, that the evidence of a book that was written a few hundred thousand years ago by somebody who obviously didn't know anything, how could they know anything in those days? You're seriously saying that you take that more seriously than the evidence of fossils, the evidence of DNA, the evidence of geographical distribution, the evidence of comparative anatomy, comparative physiology. Does anybody really want to defend that position? Well, I do. I believe in God because whenever I read a book or in my religion, Islam, whenever I read a book or something, they got all the evidence that they wrote at that time but they didn't know and they found out it's right now. So they found out? It's right now, so... It's right now, so... Everything um, they wrote is right. Uh, so, um, for example, they wrote about dinosaurs and they wrote about... No, they didn't write about these things, but they wrote like about how the baby developed and no one knew that at that time. And they find it out now. Yeah. So, your criterion for agreeing with it is that it, we now, science has found out certain things and lo and behold you find that something like that was in your holy book. Why not just go to the, the modern evidence and say, well, that's what I believe because it is the evidence. The evidence supports it. Why do you go back to your holy book and say, oh, well, I believe in the holy book because it said that? Why don't you just say, I believe in these facts because that's what the evidence shows. The evidence shows that babies develop in this way. Richard. Yeah. But, um, didn't Charles Darwin write a book which led on to people researching what he thought? So isn't that like the same as right, like religious right. books. Oh, okay, I see what you're saying. You're saying, isn't, isn't The Origin of Species by Charles Darwin, as it were, my holy book? Yeah. Yes. No, 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 definitely, definitely not. And that, if I could, if there's one thing I'd like to get across to you, it, it, it would be that. There is no holy book of science. Science is constantly changing as new evidence comes in. Darwin was right about some things, he was wrong about some things. Darwin was completely wrong about genetics, for example. Everything Darwin said about genetics is pretty much flat wrong. Uh, and now we know that. Uh, not that Darwin wasn't a great man, he was a hugely great man, but uh, the new evidence that has come in shows that he was wrong about genetics. <coughs> uh, new evidence that comes in shows that Darwin was right about the fundamental idea that we are all cousins of everybody else, that's to say all animals and all plants are cousins of each other. We are cousins of oak trees 
and kangaroos and wombats. Darwin said that, and he was right. By modern standards, maybe future science will prove that wrong, but I doubt it. But the point is, science is always moving on. There is no holy book. We don't say, I believe this because Darwin said it. We say, I believe this because all the evidence points in that direction. And as it happens, when we look back, we find that Darwin was the first to realise quite a lot of that evidence. What do you think about, that was a great question, what do you think about what you said? Yeah, um, but what would, what would you think if... Um, Oh, I've forgotten the question. <laughs> <laughs> Never mind. Come back, come back to me. I've okay, come, come, come back to it. I was just going to say, you talk about the evidence of evolution, but there's one major evidence, which is the missing link. That's probably why people are so sceptical, because the missing link hasn't been found yet, which is why people are so sceptical of okay, evolution. Okay, well, by, by missing link, what do you mean? Like, there's this so-called um, thing that's out there that relates humans to apes. That's like the closest link to humans. And the way that we've evolved from like a common ancestor to an ape. Yeah. Um, this, this phrase, missing link, used to be very fashionable. I'm actually rather astonished to hear anybody using it today. I mean, since the phrase missing link used to be used, we've now discovered a huge number of fossils. I mean, fossils are being dug up mostly, well, all in, in Africa, because that's where humans evolved. And we now have an enormous number of fossils, which are, in a very real sense, missing links between us and, or well, they're no longer missing, they are links between us and the common ancestor of chimpanzees and humans. There aren't any fossils as it happens. Let me just, can I draw on, the, on this? Um, no. Okay, well, and I, I'm sorry, the, the director's um, bossing me around and saying I, must, I, must, I mustn't explain that. Um, um, the, you, you've got the common ancestor of humans and chimpanzees way back in time, and it branched like that. This is humans, this is chimpanzees. Lots and lots of links, lots and lots of no longer missing links on the line to humans. As it happens, there aren't any missing links, or the, rather they're still missing, on the lines from that ancestor to chimpanzees. But there's absolutely no question that, that there are plenty of fossils. That, the missing link, if you must use that phrase, has been found over and over again in Africa. Yeah. So um, you said the new evidence came in that suggested Darwin's, some of Darwin's evidence was wrong. Yes. So what if, what would you do if new evidence came in to suggest that evolution didn't actually pan out as you suggested it? I, I, I would be extremely interested. I would examine the evidence. And if the evidence seemed to support um, a change in, in, in my view, I would immediately change my view. And I recommend that policy to you. Look at the evidence, and if the evidence requires you to change your mind, change your mind. That's what I would do. Does anybody think there is evidence that challenges evolution? That you might have to measure that? I would love to hear some evidence that challenges evolution. So if anybody's got any, um, let's hear it. No? No, thank you. What do you think about the question of the religious, religious truth, scientific truth? I mean, you asked the question in the first place. It was a great question. Um, I don't know. Because if you can be made to believe something in science, and then you can be made to believe something in religious studies, but, and then it's really up to you what you believe. You can't just say that. Well, look, I, I, I hate this phrase made to believe. I mean, that, that, that's an awful thing. And, and I would hate to anybody to think I was trying to make anybody believe anything. I'm asking you to look at the evidence. Now, if your RE teacher is teaching you about Adam and Eve, then what I suggest you do is ask your RE teacher, do you really believe that Adam and Eve existed? Uh, do you really believe that the world started uh, only a few thousand years ago, my bet is that your RE teacher will say, no, I don't really believe that. I believe it's a myth, I believe it's a very beautiful story, I believe it's a story that can have some poetic meaning for us today, but no, I do not believe in Adam and Eve as one couple who were created from nothing, who were created from dust or whatever it was, or mud or, or ribs or something. Um, and if, if, and I would be very, very surprised if your RE teacher actually says that they believe it. I think, I think you'll find that if you ask, and I, I ask you to do this, ask your RE teacher what they really believe, and, and I bet they'll say something like, oh, it's symbolic, it's a story. It's a story that was made up uh, 
I think probably by the Babylonians in the case of the Adam and Eve story, probably under, under different names. Uh, and they will say, or they should say, that all over the world there are lots of different myths. In Nigeria there's one myth, in, in, in East Africa you'll find other myths, in India you'll find other myths. And they're all beautiful, in Australian Aboriginals, other myths, they're all rather beautiful, elegant, poetic ideas for what happened. But uh, no RE teacher, I suggest, will tell you that they literally believe it's true. I wonder, has anybody got a question about you know, how it could be that really complicated things like something like an eye, for instance, evolves? Has anybody got a thing to think about that? Um, yeah, how is it possible that the heart has evolved, um, no, the human heart has evolved over, um, over a period of time? Okay, um, how is it possible that the human heart evolved over a period of time? Um, has anybody got any ideas about that? What, first of all, why is it a difficult question? Can you see why it's a difficult question? I mean, one, one thing that might occur to you is that, is that a heart, obviously it's a pump, it's a, it's a pump for blood, uh, and uh, if, if, if anything goes wrong with it, it doesn't work and you, and you die. And you might say, well, how does it evolve gradually? How, how do you survive with only half a heart? Is that, is that the kind of thing you're, you, you mean? Anybody get, got any ideas about how you survive with half an anything? Half a wing, half a, half a kidney, half a heart? Yeah? If... if um if we were born with two organs, then why, why is it some people um, donate to um, give one because we don't need the two in the first place, so why are we born with two? Sorry. Okay. Oh. It's, it's, an, it's, a, it's, a, it's an excellent question. Uh, we, we have two kidneys. Why were we born with two kidneys if when somebody needs a kidney you can donate it and, and still, still survive? Anybody got any, any suggestions on that? God might have created it so you might help people to survive. Yes. Um, any other suggestions? Yeah. So, so is, it, is it possible if one kidney is not working that... If it's, if it, is it possible that if one kidney is not working, the other one should start working to help yeah. kick in, then, then other people wouldn't need donations yeah. for new kidneys? Um, I, I think, I think that's, that's getting, getting there. I, I think the answer probably is partly that although you can survive with only one kidney, you're, you're more likely to die if you've only got one kidney. And therefore, you are actually better off with two kidneys than one. But because we live in a rather feather-bedded society with doctors and hospitals who can look after us, we can actually survive rather well with only one kidney. So that might be one possible answer. Another slightly different way of answering the question would be that one of the reasons why we have two of everything is that our embryology is, it is a symmetrical embryology. We're symmetrical about the midline. And so something about the way embryology works means that we tend to have two of everything. We don't, as a matter of fact, have two hearts, of course. Um, but we have two of, of, uh, m of most other things. But uh, back to the previous point, you, you, you can survive with, with one kidney, but you're probably better off with two. Sorry, um, I just wanted to know, what's, what's your take on Plato's theory of life? and whether, w whether we're living in a matrix. And sorry, I, I, I don't think that, that's not going to get us anywhere, I don't think so, I'm sorry. Um, I, I don't know what you mean by a matrix, but I... Whether we're, um, we're not living in, re in reality, we're living in like a shadow world. Um, you mean whether what we're experiencing is not actually reality, and it's, yeah. I think that's a fascinating idea. Uh, I mean, maybe we're, uh, we're all living in a, some vast, great computer simulation. Um, it's getting a bit off the point of, of Darwinism, how, however. I why do we need to find out about evolution? Why do we need to find out about evolution? Why do we need to find out about evolution? Uh, because it is the explanation for our existence, and uh, because it explains such a huge number of facts, because everything we know about life is explained by it. You might as well ask, why do we need to know about anything? Uh, and I hope that you all are sufficiently curious to want the answers to the questions of why the world is the way that it is. What is the question that you think about that? Because um, like every religion got something like to believe, and then people come up with theories and facts, so they might be confused about it. They don't know what to believe. 
They might be confused about it. What do people think about that? It's, a, it's such a bad thing to be confused that we should all stop learning anything. Is that, is that, does that anybody else agree with that? Well, because like, I believe in my religion, so whenever I read about evolution or that, I, I can't understand it. I don't believe it, just like believe my religion. So. Right. So you know what you believe when you start, and any new book that says anything different, you, you well, don't read I, it or what? Even if it's got evidence, so it's just like, I follow the stronger evidence, which is the holy book. So. Uh, so the reason you believe it is because that's the one you were told first. Is that a good general principle that what anything well, because, you're told first? Like, you I'm finding out like more things in about God and the creation. So, and whenever I like read something and just like find out the right thing, and I don't know. It's okay. So so is that, I've got it right. You. You know what you believe because it says so in the Quran. Yeah. Whenever you read anything that contradicts the Quran, you say that must be wrong. It might be. Yeah. Anybody else agree with that? Anybody else disagree with it? Yeah? Um, I kind of disagree with that. I think the idea of religion and evolution sort of <coughs> having a bit of a. Um, I think the thing is that like people have been like in like religion has been indoctrinated into people from like a young age, and people believe like whatever you've been brought up to believe, I think that mainly dominates your views yes. on a lot of the things that you, you know, the new things you learn. Like if people have been brought up with a very strong background in religion and been brought up to believe in creationism and that Adam and Eve or something, just the idea of anything <coughs> new kind of is so alien to them that they don't want to accept mm. it. What, were you brought up in a religion? I've been brought up with a religion, but I think my, my um, I, brought up, I believe in evolution, but I believe the, the whole like cause and effect theory about how, um, the cause of evolution was creation, was Wh God. Which like, religion were you brought up in? I've been brought up with Hinduism, but I believe in like, um, more so sort of Einsteinian religion kind of a thing. Yes. Like, but, um, I mean, you, so, so you brought up in a Hindu religion, he's brought up in, in is Islam, um, some of you have been brought up Christian. Do you ever argue with each other about, about the contradictions between your different religions? Yeah? Um, the thing is, there are so, there are so many theories, it's, um, and they say that theory is based on facts, so I think that's why people are confused and they argue well, which one's right. Yes. Well, I don't know how many different religions are represented in this room, but they all contradict each other, uh, and we have the, the scientific evidence as well. Do any of you think there's some reason to favour any one of those over the others? No? No reason? Yeah. As some of them sound more believable, as in they're easier to understand than others, because evolution, people think that it's like so amazing that it happened, just random coincidence, that they believe like it started because of something else, so it's easier to understand for other people, that's why they'd rather believe in yes. religion. Um, for, for, I, I must stop you for a moment, it, it's not random coincidence, um, it's natural selection, which is very non-random. Uh, but, yes, yeah, sorry, um, you, it, it's easy, it's, you say it's difficult to understand, yeah. but things that are difficult to understand doesn't make them untrue, does it? Maybe the truth is difficult to understand. Actually, it's not that difficult to understand. Do, 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 do you have difficulties understanding evolution? Or just in difficulty of believing it? Has evolution um, made us um, like almost damned to fail? In, in our life because we've evolved so much so if we were to take humans out of the equation would um, would it be a perfect universe with everything lives in harmony but si um, since human has evolved the world has only become worse uh, global warming and things like that so if we were to, if we weren't here would the earth be live in perfect harmony without us would it be a lot better without humans hmm. what does anybody think about that to all the other question it's a very interesting question would the world be a better place without, without humans? Do, do you have a view on that? I think it's because um, we've developed... Um, yeah. You have to wait for the cameraman yeah. to... Yeah. No, it, we, um, we've developed technologies to, so we can develop technology to like, make the world perfect. If we can develop technology to make it worse, we can make it better. Yeah. There's nothing new about intelligent design. It's, it's, um, has there, have any of you heard the phrase intelligent design? What do you think it means? The idea that um, there was, you know, the way that the world has been designed, it's like been sort of 
almost like des it's an architect sort of sitting, you know, like almost designed it perfectly. So it like facilitates people's needs and things like that with natural resources and things mm -hmm. like that. That's like humans as well. No one can make a human, no. And like eyes, heart, mouth, nose, no one can make them. Like can they feel and have senses and everything? No, that's true. Uh, that's because it took three billion years to evolve. It would, you'd hardly expect it to happen overnight again, would you? If it takes, if it took that long. Yeah. Um, surely you can't believe that only, it's only science can explain everything that's happened since the start of the earth and that there's no religious background into what, into what happened, like God um, creating brains, such an intricate design that um, it, can, it surely cannot have been made just by science. Uh, anybody got any views on that? Does anybody, anybody want to support the view that uh, the explanation for our existence is a scientific explanation? Not a single one. So, you all of you support a religious view of, of um, yeah, you, you. I believe in evolution, but um, there's like certain things that I don't understand. Good. Like Go you on. didn't explain how the heart, how we could live with half a heart or okay. not, not a fully developed heart. Okay. Good. Um, I mean, the, the answer to the how, how could we live with half a something question, I mean, it's, it's, it's a very common question, heart, eye, kidney, whatever it is, is that um, when these things started, they were simpler and it might not have been such an efficient heart or eye or wing or whatever it was when it first started, but it was good enough to be better than no heart or eye or wing. Uh, and so you get a gradual increase. After all, very small animals really don't need a heart at all because they can, they, they're so small that the natural circulation within their tiny bodies is enough to get the info, to get the substances, the physiological substances, to all of the bodies. It's only when you get big bodies that you need a heart, you need a bloodstream at all, to, to pass the materials around. And so you start off needing only a very small, primitive, simple heart. And gradually you need a bigger and bigger and more complicated heart as the body gets bigger. So it is a gradual process. And all you need to explain it is this gradual increasing ramp 